Hey guys and welcome back to a new video and a new start of a little playlist which is all about I.O. essentials in a JVM environment specifically with Kotlin. So what does that mean? It will be about all kinds of in and out related concepts about the file system, how that actually works, how we interact with the file system in JVM environments, so with Java or Kotlin typically, and whether you now take this knowledge and use it for some kind of JVM backend environment, whether you use it for a desktop app, whether you use it for an Android app, that is completely up to you because these concepts and essentials will apply to all those platforms. So we will talk about all kinds of stuff like files, what a file actually is, how we interact with files, how we reference these from our file system. And then we will talk a lot about file streams, not specifically just file streams, but input and output streams, how these work, how we can write data, how we can read data. You will learn about things like file descriptors. You will learn about buffered reading and buffered writing, how all that works on a lower level, but also how we can make use of uh, handy utility functions to work with that on a higher level in the most efficient way. I'm here in a blank, a native Kotlin IntelliJ project, because I think in such a project, it's the easiest to, to really showcase how we can interact with the file system, because it's a very visual thing, since files that we create here are directly visible here in our folder and file hierarchy. And let's first of all think about what a file actually is. Because most of you, when you take a look at this hierarchy here, will think, okay, we have this main KT file, we have git ignore as a file, build a Gradle KTS, Gradle properties, and so on. And yes, all those are files. But on a very low level, on the system level, a file is not only what we typically consider a file, but also folders are considered files. This is at least true on Unix-based systems. And yes, folders are still kind of special files. So it's not exactly the same as a real file that contains actual content, since folders are obviously used to group uh, files, ideally related files. But it's still important to know this because in certain scenarios, especially when we now um, start to interact with our file system, then we can, for example, create a file reference here in our code. And that works by uh, invoking the constructor of this file class from Java IO. That's really the central unit to uh, the central class to um, reference a file from the file system. What this now does is it, does, it, it isn't only used to reference a specific file with actual contents, but it can also be used to reference a folder. That is really why we need to highlight that that a folder could also be seen as a file, especially um, when it's about referencing these. For example, here in the constructor, we could say we want to reference a specific file at a specific file path. Obviously, we need to somehow link the location of that file in our file system. For example, we could say our build.gradle KTS file. That is located here in our root folder, which is uh, actually the directory in which our program will be launched when we run it here. And therefore, this will also be chosen as the relative directory from where we can reference our file system. So if we don't append, uh, if we don't prepend anything here, like any specific uh, system path or so, and we really just type the file name that we want to access, then this always refers to the relative path from where our program is run. So at the same location where our final executable is, we now assume that there is also a build.gradle KTS file. In this case, it will only be true during development since afterwards, this will be uh, compiled into probably a jar file or so. But let's just proceed with this to see what we cannot do with that. So if we type file dot, then we have lots of functions here uh, that we can use to either do something with the file to make certain checks based on that file. You can see we could refer to the parent file and with these types of fields and functions, it suddenly also makes sense because a parent file must be a folder or we have those make directory commands in order to just create a directory in our file system. If this would be a directory you want to create, but this time we want to refer to it as a real file. So what we could do is, for example, we could print the file length, which will be the file size. If we run this, then take a look, you can see 260 bytes. This file is large. And it's really important to understand that the moment we create a file here in our code, this is really, really just a reference, just a pointer to a file on the file system with this specific file path. It's not the case that when we actually create this file reference here in our code, that the whole file will suddenly be in memory or the actual contents will be read at that point. We could also have something completely off here that, that does not exist at all. And if we run this, this will work without any problems. This won't crash, this won't cause an issue because it's really just a reference. We just say, hey, we want to do something with a file that has this specific path. But until we do something with this file reference, nothing will happen. It's really just a pointer to this specific file. It may exist, it may not exist, it may be a folder. We don't yet know. 
So for example, if we wanted to create a file, we could say, I want to create the hello.txt file, and then we can say file.create new file. If we run this, then there will be a new file here, hello.txt. And right now we haven't written anything into that file. That is um, what we will specifically do in the video about input and output streams. But on a very high level, what we could do is we could say file.write text, and we write something like hello world here. If we then run this, take a look in this file, then we see the contents hello world. But again, this is a really high level function. <laughs> it doesn't work as easily as that. And it definitely makes sense to also understand how writing to a file and reading from a file works on a lower level, which we'll do in the next video. But what now happens if we want to create a bunch of directories? So we want to place a certain file in a directory that may not exist yet. In that case, what we can do is we can reference a directory. We could say hello slash world slash hello dot text, for example. If we would now just create this file, run this, then you could see um, it actually crashes because it says no such file or directory. Because if we just place the file path here, then what the file class uh, thinks is that we want to reference the hello text file inside of these folders, but these folders don't exist here in our current hierarchy. But what happens if we want to create these folders in case this file does not exist yet? We could simply go ahead and say, if file that exists, so if it does not exist, then we want to say, file that make directories. What this command will do is it will first of all check, does the file exist? If it does not exist, it will take all those directories here um, from this file path and simply create these. We can then remove this here and run this again. And then you can see a directory appears here in our folder. If we open this, um, well, it kind of does what we want, but this is not really expected. We have a hello text folder, but it's, it's a folder. It's not a file anymore. Because the moment we call make directories, the whole file will be interpreted or the, the path parts will be interpreted as actual directories. If we don't want that, what we could do is we could rename this to the actual folder we want to create without this hello text. And then we also reference a certain file where we say, this is now a file that we want to place in a certain parent where we can pass another file now, so a folder, and we give it a name, hello.txt. If the folder does not exist, we create all of our folders, and then we can say file.create new file. And if we now actually delete those folders here first, rerun the app, then we now have a folder. And if we open this, we have our hello text file inside of that folder. What's also really important to understand is how file paths actually work and how we can make use of relative paths in our file system. So as I said, by default, the path will be chosen where our um, executable is run. And this is accomplished by actually prepending an implicit dot slash here. So this dot, if our um, file path starts with this dot, then that always refers to the current directory where we are in. So the directory where our executable is run. That means if we delete our folder again and rerun this, this will lead to the exact same output. If we would prepend this with a double dot, that would refer to the parent file, to the parent folder of our current relative path. So our executable again runs in our IO essentials folder. If we now start our path with a double dot, then we refer to the folder where this IO essentials folder is being placed in. This likely won't run here because we um, lack the necessary permissions. I could try this, but I'm pretty sure this won't work. It doesn't work, very cool. <laughs> So it seems like we also have a permission outside of our environment here. And we don't see this right now because the hello world folder was now created in the folder where our IO essentials is being placed in. Um, but we could do something like this. We could say IO essentials slash hello slash world, delete the folder again, run this. And now you again see hello world, hello that text. Because we first refer to the parent folder of IO Essentials, but then again hop into the IO Essentials folder. So that's really important to understand that with these um, double dots, we can refer to the parent folder of our current relative file path. If we don't want to place a relative file path, so if we don't want to always um, assume we are inside of this IO Essentials folder where our executable is being placed, then we can also just start with a forward slash. What this would now do is it would start the file path at the absolute root of our file system. And it would then look for an IO Essentials Hello World folder directly at the root. This is now a place where we really likely don't have permissions unless we maybe run this as an administrator. So if we do this, um, yeah, now we actually get no such file or directory here at our create new file, um, even though we have created the, um, the folder before.
But also if we take a look here, so this would now be the directory where this is placed at the absolute root of our file system here, in my case on a Mac in uh, Macintosh HD, where we have all those system files, but you can see there is no IO essentials file um, or folder being placed since we lack the uh, necessary permission. But that is where we are at the next topic. Every single file has a certain set of permissions. Because if we take a look at the file, whoops, the file here, then there are three types of main file permissions. On the one hand, read, write, and execute. And these permissions are being applied to every single file on the level of the operating system. So that means we can also set on specific permissions for a specific user on our OS. We could, for example, say uh, this specific other user may be able to execute our file, but may not be able to change it. So be able to um, write it and uh, read it. This is really what we can do with every single file. If we own the file, so our process owns the file, then we can also set those permissions. So we can say set executable, we can set, uh, set it to read only or set it to uh, writable. And if you actually want to inspect which files have which permissions, then of course that works via code. Um, we can of course reference a file and then check uh, whether we can execute that, can read that or so. Um, but very often you also just need to check this on your Unix based file system. And this really just belongs to the uh, Unix OS basics. So we can just go to our terminal, which will also by default just execute here in our root folder. You can see this is the path where we are currently in our terminal. In order to just normally list files, we can use the ls command. You can see we just list all files here in our um, current folder, which you can see also includes folders. Uh, but we can add certain arguments to this ls command by saying lsl, for example. This will uh, just list additional information, like for example, the file permissions. If we do this, then we see a little bit of a longer or more detailed list. And specifically for the file permissions, this first part here is relevant. Looks very cryptic, but in the end, the first letter of this um, kind of string here refers to the uh, file type. So D stands for, this is directory. You can see we're talking about the build directory here. If it's simply a dash, then this is just a normal file. There are also some other types of files like symbolic links, for example. But let's focus on directories and normal files here. And then we have nine characters that can be either R, W, or X, and that repeated three times. So we have three sets of those R, W, X characters. And these are really now the file permissions. The first three characters refer to the file permissions for the owner of the file, for the actual user who has created that file. You can see in my case, it's all me. <laughs> I am the owner of all those files. And since I have a letter for all these options, R, W, and X, if I am currently logged in, then I am allowed to read, write, and execute the file. Then on Unix-based file systems, we can also have a certain group, which is what these, um, this, these middle characters here are for. So the group in this case could be staff, for example, or could be something like moderator. So just a group of users that own this file. So these middle characters refer to uh, the permissions for that specific group that owns this file. So you can see here, this group would not have write permission in this case. And the last three characters here refer to all others. So other users, other groups, so people who, who, who don't own this file or accounts and groups that don't own this file. So assume I would now log in with a different user that does not, this, uh, that does not own this file, then that different user could still go here and read the contents of that file or execute it, but could not write something new to that file. And of course, we can go in a, a lot more detail here, but I think it's just important to understand that these types of permission strings exist, that you roughly understand what these are for, and in case you need to check in your terminal um, what the permissions for a specific file there, um, are and which permissions there are, because very often if you need to work with a file system and files in your code, uh, then you just need to also be aware that uh, files have certain permissions. But the last thing for this video that I want to show you is just how we can list files in our code. So if you have a reference to a specific folder and you want to list all files inside of that folder and just iterate over these, um, that also works pretty easily. For example, by just uh, referencing our current folder where we are in, by just placing a dot, so to refer to the current file path where we're in, we don't want to have this file anymore, um, and then we also don't need this if statement. We would just say folder dot list files, which gives us an array of file, which we can then make a null check and iterate over. So we get a reference to each file in that folder, and we could print it file dot name, for example. If we run this, then we see all those file names here in our current folder where we're running this in. This again also includes folders as a simple file name, and these folders actually also contain files. So could it be cool if we would actually also learn how we could uh, print the files inside of those folders? Yes, 
that of course works with recursion since every single folder could again contain n number of more folders. And we again want to look into every single of these folders inside of every folder in our folder. <laughs> so that sounds very complex, but it's actually not, um, especially due to the recursion. Um, this is, it's quite easy to understand this actually. So we could have a function list files recursively, for example. We give this a folder as a file reference again, since again, a file can be a reference to a folder as well. And we could say we have an indentations level. Since I want to print all those file names here and indent these a little bit when, um, when these are in a child folder. So initially we don't have any indentations and then actually we don't want to return this as a list of files, but just print these. Let's call it that way as well, print files recursively. And all in all, we really just need to take our folder. We want to list all files ins inside that folder, which is both actual files as well as the folders there. We then say for each, reference each child, which could be a folder or a normal file. And then we could construct a line that we just want to print in our console for that file. We could say build string, um, where we just repeat our indentations level. So by um, how, how deep we are already in our hierarchy. Of course, if we hopped into a folder, and then again into a folder, we want to indent this hello text file in here a little bit more than if the file would have been placed in this hello folder than if it would have been placed in the root folder. So here we just want to append two spaces for every single indentation level we have. And then we can say we append the child.name, so the file name, and maybe actually with a dash in before, and we say child.name. We then say we want to print this. So we print our line, regardless of whether our child is a folder or not. But if it's a folder, so if our child is actually a directory, we can check for that. Then we want to also print all those files recursively inside that directory again. So we say print files recursively, this time not using our root folder, we've passed with this function initially, but our child, since our child in this case is a folder. And we say, we take our indentations level and we increment it by one. And if we now go here in our main function and we say print files recursively and pass in our folder and we launch this, then this is our output. We get all those files in our root folder. If we have a folder, then we will iterate over all those files and folders inside that folder, print that. Here we have a Gradle wrapper folder. We print those recursively and so on. So we now have a full tree here of all of our files in any of those folders in our uh, root folder. So I hope this gave you a decent impression of what this file reference is, how files work, how permissions work. In the next video about streams, we will then really get into reading from files and writing to files, which is of course typically what you want to do when you interact with files in code. Thanks so much for watching. I will then see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>